Now let's talk about the main steam. So this line right here is a main steam inlet, right? This is a superheated steam that comes off the superheater. It comes into the plant. And then the first thing that we're going to see is a hydraulic stop valve um, right here. Um, all turbines are going to have to have some way of shutting down the steam flow essentially instantaneously if there's some sort of problem anywhere in the system. So that's a hydraulic valve. Um, it's just going to be able to shut the steam flow down in a matter of seconds. Um, as we continue, um, this is actually now, this whole thing here is a large hydraulic control system. So, you know, under hydraulic pressure, and you can see the hydraulic line down here below, um, under hydraulic pressure, um, you'll be able to slowly move the plunger, I'll just call it the piston, up and down. Um, there's a, a big uh, fulcrum up top, so that's actually going to move up and down, and then that controls a valve that's going to give you, uh, you know, various rates of steam flow. Now, one other thing I want to identify up here in the front are just some of the vibration sensors. I mean, these things, anything that looks like that, those are vibration monitors. Um, there's a lot of vibration monitors around. Again, we understand that if you can monitor the vibration, then that should give you some sort of advance notice of some sort of wear taking place within the turbine. And now what I'd like to do is actually kind of move across here. This is really where it's unfortunate that we are going through a pandemic because usually this would be a field trip and I would let the students loose, all you guys, loose in this place to climb around, walk around, explore. Um, this is just a fun place to be. Nonetheless, this is the actual turbine itself. Now, note that this is a 10 megawatt turbine. You might say, well, that's pretty small, but you know, this is typical for 10 megawatts. Um, a modern steam turbine, let's say in a nuclear power plant, um, might produce as much as 1700 megawatts. So in a modern power plant, a large one, we could easily be talking about a turbine that's one or 200 times larger than this. In fact, if you look at this entire structure in here, this would not even hold the entire steam turbine. Um, now, that's in a large central station power plant. Here we're talking about a small 10 megawatt plant. So this is a turbine itself. Um, as we walk through, um, you might be able to sense the extraction steam lines that drop down from the turbine. Um, as we continue, um, we would note that directly below the turbine is going to be the inlet to the condenser. So the extraction steams kinda, steam lines kind of come off and down in the front. Uh, the condenser is directly below the turbine, and that's where the discharge is. Okay. And then we would recognize that as we have a turbine, I think this one spins at about 5,200 RPM, um, we need to gear that down to, what, 3,600 RPM? That's 60 cycles per second because that's the frequency of electric generation. So here we have a combination coupling and gearbox. Um, the gearbox is going to reduce the speed, but it also acts as a coupler. Um, keep in mind that you're always going to have some sort of a coupling. Um, this would be a hydraulic coupling. Um, you always have to have some sort of a coupling. You don't want a large rotating device like a turbine rigidly connected to a large rotating device like an electric generator. If you have some sort of mechanical failure in one, if you didn't have a coupling, you would then have mechanical failure in the other. So it's better to just destroy a turbine than to destroy the turbine generator combination. So, you know, the coupling, you know, is going to give you the ability to transfer power at the right speed, but it also gives you a little bit of a safety net there in case you have some sort of a catastrophic mechanical failure. Now, um, we talked about um, lubricating oil. Um, you know, there's lube oil lines, these green lines here. There's lube oil to the turbine. Um, you know, here's lube oil, um, and uh, it doubles as hydraulic oil to the gearbox. And um, then as we continue, you know, now we have the shaft. Um, typically, there's going to be some sort of mechanical coupling in here as well. So yeah, I'm just going to walk around, and you can stay there. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's going to be some sort of mechanical coupling inside here you know, again, to give you the ability to dissociate the gearbox from the generator. And then this is the actual generator itself. So this is the electric generator. Um, the generator is not only going to have some um, lubricating oil lines, um, which would be these, um, but it's also going to have cooling lines. So we'll be able to see the cooling lines um, from, well, I guess we can see them up here. So here are cooling lines, um, cooling in, cooling out. 
And, you know, it's a generator, right? It's producing a lot of electricity. It's going to dissipate a certain amount of heat. So you need to be able to keep the generator cool. And then outside the large building here, um, just to show you a few other lines. So this is the main steam line in its entirety. Um, the main steam line, of course, comes from the superheater, which is off the furnace. Um, we can also see here's the lube oil line. So the lube oil comes in and, you know, is used to lube all the large rotating equipment inside. Here's the cooling water lines in and out. Um, of course, these are used to keep the generator cool. And then one last thing to show, um, you know, another one of those things that you wouldn't see on any thermodynamic diagram. Um, I think we can just call this the turning gear. Um, you have a very, very large shaft that runs through the entire system. And if you let this system sit um, without being in rotation, that shaft could sag. And the next time you started it up, you're going to have a massive vibration issue. Um, you, you may also have a clearance issue and the system may not even work at that point. So when you shut a system down, I mean, this one isn't operating because the whole plant is shut down forever. But when you shut a system down, um, there's a little electric motor in there and that's going to continually keep everything rotating. Um, usually very slow, you know, maybe just one revolution per minute or two revolutions per minute, but you know, enough to keep the shaft true so that when you do start it up in earnest, you know, it'll be um, easy, easy to, to operate the device. Now there's one other line up here that I also want to identify. And we'll just come around here. Um, this line right here, it looks like it's one of the extractions and, and it kind of is, um, but it's not an extraction steam line. This is what we call the gland seal. Um, sometimes called the steam seal. Um, let's keep in mind that a turbine uh, that is spinning, you can't have physical contact between the rotating shaft of the turbine and the casing of the turbine. If you did, it would seize up. Um, so you have to have a small space in there. But if you have a small space in there, then the steam from within the turbine is going to escape. So what do you do? Well, you have the gland seal system. Basically, it's a series of rings. Um, typically, they're made out of something like Teflon um, or, or even graphite. Um, which are solids, but they're quite, quite slippery. And under steam pressure, these rings clamp down. Uh, and these rings are right where the shaft goes through the casing. And this is done under steam pressure. So the steam will pressurize these rings, it will clamp down, and that'll give you a nice tight seal so no steam leaks out. Um, no steam leaks out of the turbine. Now that gland seal steam um, is now going to come through here. Um, eventually it's going to be cooled and um, then sent back over into the condenser. 